Friends, welcome to Cove Presbyterian Church in what has been a sobering time in our nation's history this week. I cannot read scripture today and preach until I speak to the violence set loose in our nation's capital. It has been a shameful week in our country's history, and anyone with ears to listen has seen this train wreck of violence coming. My prayer today is that finally, finally, it might be a week in which we have regained our moral voice, not to pretend that we all basically agree on most social and political matters because we do not. I pray, though, that we can regain our moral voice against bullying our way by means of intimidation and violence into getting what we want. I pray that we can regain our moral voice and insist that lies and violence are tools of the weak, but that the truth especially the truth that we know in the life and ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus, is the truth that sets us free. So join me in a time of prayer that our nation, our nation's leaders, and each of us will regain our moral voice. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we make them in the name of the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The sermon today is called Nebo Rambo and is taken from a text from the Gospel of Mark 1, verses 4 through 11. Listen now for the word of God. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit like a dove descending on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I had not been serving the church long when the phone rang. The grandmother, the indisputable matriarch of the family, was calling on behalf of her daughter, who had just had a baby. I congratulated her on the good news and offered to visit the parents and the new child in the hospital. My offer was quickly dismissed. 
The grandmother moved on to her main concern. <clears throat> Pastor Charles, I'm a calling to arrange to have the baby done on Saturday afternoon, March 5th. I hope you're free. It will be a lovely ceremony in the rose garden behind my house. After a deep breath, I mustered my best pastoral response. I explained that for Presbyterians, baptism is a community sacrament. A time not only for individuals and families to make sacred promises before God, but for the whole community to do so. I told her that I'd be glad to meet with her daughter and son-in-law to discuss the baptism of their child. That was not the response she wanted. She went on to tell me that she'd been a Presbyterian all her life, and that all my predecessors had done her children in her rose garden, and that her first grandchild would be done there on March 5th. When I tried to say more, she informed me that she would find someone suitable to do the ceremony. And then she told me not to anticipate any future funds coming for her family to the church, and promptly hung up. In fairness to the grandmother, who asked me to do her new grandchild, the way Presbyterians understand baptism has evolved a great deal over her lifetime and mine. For years in most mainline Protestant churches, baptism was a sentimental and uh, somewhat peripheral religious rite of passage for children and families, something to be noted in the baby book along with the first words spoken or the first step taken. It often carried with it the notion of something to be done to our children, like cutting the first precious lock of hair. On the day of baptism, almost always of an infant, the baptismal font was pulled out of a closet and moved from its visual obscurity in an alcove of the sanctuary and then neatly stored back out of sight when the deed was done. Where churches ever got such a diminished, utilitarian, and sentimental understanding of baptism, I'm not sure. I am sure they did not get it from reading the Gospel of Mark. And Mark, John baptizes in the River Jordan, not as a perfunctory rite of passage for penitent Jews. He baptizes in the name of the one who in the baptism of Jesus tears open the buffer zone between heaven and earth. Roger Gantz, the new editor for the Presbyterian Outlook, notes, Mark tells us that as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being ripped apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. It's important to note that heavens do not simply, the heavens do not simply open for something that opens can close. Mark tells us that the heavens were ripped apart. That reality was irreparably altered as a fissure in the heavens appeared, making a permanent el elimination of the boundary between heaven and earth. Mark's language strips away any perfunctory notion of baptism. It says that every time the baptismal waters flow, a new identity is formed, a new name is given, and the same name that is given by God is given by a God who is on the loose. My friend and New Testament scholar Brian Blunt says that God on the loose results in a wild world out of religious and regulatory control. 
A world so sure that God is right around the corner that it stops thinking about standing in line and it starts lining up to help each other. It's a world that cares more about purifying those who are sinners than being pure and separate from sinners. It's a world that cares more about touching and holding those who have dirtied themselves or have been dirtied by the situations of their lives than it cares about sweeping their churches and lives clean of anybody who makes mistakes. It's a world that would willingly and willfully break laws and customs that segregate people from each other, break laws that send people into unjust wars, break laws that allow the powerful and wealthy to have more opportunity in life than the weak and poor. It's a world that would look very much like Mark's world of Jesus walking around possessed by the power of the Holy Spirit. In such a world, you either go with a man and help him create the holy chaos he's creating, or you find a way to do everything you can to stop him so that you can get your people back in line. In 1994, Rwanda was the scene of one of the most devastating holocausts of the 20th century. In this largely Christian country, violence between Hutus and Tutsis left nearly a million people dead. Greg Jones, dean of the Duke Divinity School, tells of a trip to Rwanda. The next morning, Jones writes, we took a bus to the small Muslim village called Naram Rambo. Our host said, this is the only area in Rwanda that didn't experience the genocide. Why is that? A student asked. Because their identity as as Muslims is so fundamental, so important to them, that they could not envision killing one another. Their commitment to Allah created their fundamental identity more important than any tribal or national Identity. Reverend Jones goes on to wonder, what would it mean for Christians in Rwanda and in the United States or anywhere else to take our baptismal identity in Christ as the primary defining character of our lives, relativizing all other loyalties What if, for example, we adopted the Mennonite Central Committee's modest proposal for peace? Let Christians of the world agree that they will not kill each other. How would we then envision our identities, our lives, our relationships and commitments? As we all know from ancient and contemporary history, Muslims like Jews like Christians, like Hindus, have a tragic history of violence. And Nemirambo is more the religious exception than the rule. I am intrigued, though, by where Greg Jones and Brian Blunt are pushing us. What if baptism were more than a sweet family ritual done one Saturday morning in the Rose Garden or one Sunday in the sanctuary, a sacrament where parents agree to whatever the preacher asks and children offer their cute consent if old enough and adults say they're obligatory, we will. What if our baptism were a new set of glasses through which we see ourselves and see our God who is on the loose? According to Mark, at his baptism, Jesus heard God announce his identity. You are my beloved child. What if we heard that voice at every baptism? The reminder that before I was Joe and Marguerite's boy, 
or a native Virginian, or a proud American, I was and am a child of God, washed and claimed in the waters of baptism. And I live and love and serve in a community that wears the same birthmark and follows the same untamed God on the loose. I doubt that the day the infant Gary Charles was baptized that the congregation said this baby was born to be an ordained and installed minister in the Presbyterian Church USA to engage in a ministry of compassion and to work for justice and advocate for peace. But I am confident that long before At the time of and long since my baptism, the lively at loose God has been at work creating something new, disturbing what has grown old and tearing down all in me, all in us, all in the church, all in the world that slows our steps in following the baptized crucified and resurrected and beloved child of God, Jesus. If all that is true, if God tore open the heavens at Jesus' baptism and tears into us in ours, if our God is on the loose, Maybe we should find a closet to store this beautifully handcrafted baptismal font before the Adelus God gets hold of us. Never yet. Maybe it is time for us to fill a container of water and place it at the entrance of our homes as a front and center reminder that in baptism, you and I are the cleansed and claimed children of the absolute sky. Friends, remember, you are baptized. Friends, remember that our God is all loose. Amen. And now, friends, go into this world that God so loves and be makers of peace and justice. And in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, I love you. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Take me to the water to be baptized. Sing along with me. This is fun. Take me to the water.